Fate works in mysterious ways, and chance encounters can often change our lives in ways we would have never imagined. Number 5 When she was just 18 years old, Carol DeRange from Salt Lake City, Utah, came face to face with one of the most evil men to ever walk the earth. Carol left her home on November 8, 1974, to go to the mall and pick up some books. Little did she know that one chance encounter would change her life forever. On that day, Carol drove herself to the Fashion Place Mall in Murray, Utah, hoping to pick up a few books to read later on. She was browsing and making her way through the bookstore when she was approached by who she thought was a policeman. Carol later explained that the man was wearing a police officer's uniform, and the badge he presented to her was extremely convincing. The man identified himself as Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department, Little did Carol know she was face to face with Ted Bundy. Bundy calmly spoke to Carol and informed her that someone had tried to break into her car and that she needed to come with him right away. Having always been brought up to trust and respect authority, Carol went with him. After showing her the car, Bundy asked her to come with him to the station to make a statement to which she agreed. Although after the fact, Carol said that there wasn't anything missing from the car, and this should have been her first warning sign to Ron. While in Bundy's signature Volkswagen Bug, Carol realized that he was driving down an unfamiliar road that didn't lead to the police station. As soon as she mentioned this, Bundy flew into a rage and tried to handcuff her. However, in the ensuing chaos, Bundy accidentally placed both handcuffs onto one of her hands, allowing Carol to fight back and open the door. Once she was out of Bundy's car, she ran as fast as she could and ended up reporting her encounter to police. In an interview for the Netflix documentary Conversation with a Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes, she said, quote, I had never been so frightened in my entire life. I know this is cliche, but my whole life went before my eyes. Number 4 When 20-year-old Rebecca Gard left her day job as a telemarketer in Seattle, Washington, she couldn't believe her bad luck. By the time she had finished, the day was slowly melting into night and she was met with yet another damp and drizzly evening in Seattle. Rebecca usually got the bus home after her shift. However, the weather was bad and she didn't feel like waiting around, so instead she made her way to Pacific Highway South to hitch a ride, a decision that would turn her world upside down. During the 1980s and 1990s, Seattle police were faced with an epidemic. Spates of young women were going missing and were found murdered near the Green River. As more and more cases started popping up, Seattle PD realized they had a serial killer on their hands, calling him the Green River Killer. Little did Rebecca Gard know that on that drizzly evening in November of 1982, she would come face to face with that very same monster. As she was waiting along the Pacific Highway South, a maroon Dodge pickup truck stopped and offered her a ride. He also offered her $20 in exchange for a particular act. According to a CNN article, Gard said that the man driving the truck was boring and dull. She had no reason to suspect anything and was more than happy to earn some easy money. During the drive, the men pulled into a trailer park and instructed Gard to get out of the truck and follow him into the woods. She panicked and did as he asked. Talking to CNN, Gard recalled the event, saying, quote, All of the sudden, he starts grabbing me and we're all over the place. He tried to cover my mouth and nose. I just kept trying to breathe. He smothered me on the ground and he was sitting on top of me. Meanwhile, my thoughts are racing, saying, no, this is not my time. I want to grow up. I want to get married. I was like, this guy is not going to kill me. I don't belong here. I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. Amazingly, guards summoned the strength to overpower Ridgeway, 
throwing him into a nearby tree, allowing her to run to a nearby trailer and get help. Ridgway didn't follow her as he was in a state of shock. His victims always fought back, but they were rarely successful. It took Guard two years to report the incident to Seattle PD. She explained in several interviews that her past criminal record prevented her from coming forward through fears that she would have gotten herself into trouble or that police would not have believed her. When she did speak to the Seattle PD, she said, quote, This stuff has affected me so badly that it's hard for me to sleep at night. Since Ridgway's arrest in 2001, Guard has declined multiple interviews telling people that she just wants to get on with her life the best she can. Number 3 Professor Elaine Oswald thought nothing of it when Dr. Harold Shipman invited her over for dinner a week after he saved her life. If anything, she felt she should be the one hosting dinner to say thank you. It was, however, during this time that the details surrounding the incident became clearer, and 24 hours later, the reality finally set in for Elaine. On August 21st, 1975, Elaine, who was 25 years old at the time, booked an appointment at her local GP practice in West Yorkshire. She explained to the Guardian newspaper that she was happy to finally have met a doctor who was young and welcoming towards her. She even said that his bedside manner made her feel comfortable within a matter of minutes. Elaine had booked the appointment to speak with the doctors about pain in her left side, which the doctor prescribed an opiate painkiller for. Dr. Shipman explained to Elaine that she most likely had a kidney stone and that the painkiller would help until further tests could be run. He instructed her to go home and take two of the tablets and leave her front door unlocked so he could come by and take a blood sample later. While this may seem odd, it was common practice in the UK for doctors to perform home visits during the 1970s. Some doctors still offer house calls for elderly and vulnerable patients. When speaking to the Guardian newspaper in 2001, Elaine said, quote, He was very interested in the antique furniture that we had in the bedroom, and we were chatting generally. I know he put a needle in my left arm, but I wasn't sure what he was doing. I assumed he was taking blood because that's what he told me he was doing. I seem to remember that he was moving across my body to do something to my right arm, but I don't remember anything after that. The next thing that Elaine remembers is Dr. Shipman hovering over her, trying to keep her stable. He told her and the paramedics that arrived at the scene that she'd had an allergic reaction to the painkiller. She was transferred to the nearest hospital and was treated for her condition. It wasn't until 24 years later, in 1999, that Elaine learned of the criminal case brought against Dr. Shipman for poisoning his patients with a lethal combination of drugs. At the trial, Elaine chose to testify, saying, quote, For all this time, I have truly believed that Dr. Shipman saved my life. However, when I read about his modus operandi, I realized that I may have actually been one of his victims. Number 2 On August 21, 1982, 19-year-old Denise Williams came face to face with a man known only as the Weepy Voiced Killer. The Weepy Voiced Killer was so called because he would place calls to the police or newspaper saying he was sorry for what he had done in a distinctive whiny voice. After attacking his second victim, he phoned the police and said, quote, Will you find me? I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. The weepy voiced killer spree would come to an end when he picked up 19-year-old street worker Denise Williams. Denise was out on her usual route on August 21st, 1982 when she was approached by Paul Michael Stefani. After negotiating the price, Denise got into his car and the pair drove off to a secluded area. However, Denise sensed that something was very wrong. On what should have been the return journey, she noticed that Stefani was driving in the wrong direction 
heading out to an area she was unfamiliar with. In a split second, Denise's fight or flight instincts kicked in. As she was being attacked, she reached for a bottle that was at her feet and threw it at Stefani's face. Stefani's screams attracted the attention of neighbors and passersby, and Denise was able to get out of the situation alive. Stefani fled back to his apartment, but placed a 911 call that attracted the attention of law enforcement. The call handler noticed that Stefani sounded a lot like the weepy-voiced killer, and that his injuries were the same as what Denise Williams had reported to police just hours earlier. Stefani was arrested following this 911 call and was sentenced to serve 40 years in prison. Number 1 19 years old and three months pregnant, Maria Virachiva's life was rapidly changing day by day. Maria had moved from a Republic of Russia to Moscow as a child and worked hard to set up a good life for herself and her children. On February 23rd, 2001, she would have a chance encounter with Alexander Petrushkin, also known as the chessboard killer so-called because he would write his victims' names on a chessboard, hoping to kill 64 people to fill it. On that February day, Maria had just finished up at her new job for the day. However, she didn't want to go home as she and her boyfriend, the father of her child, had gotten into an argument earlier that morning. Maria wandered into the Moscow metro, and that's where Alexander struck. Noticing that she was in an obvious state of despair, Alexander knew that she was primed for the picking. He sympathetically approached her and struck up a conversation with her. In an interview with the Russian newspaper, Maria revealed the details of that conversation, saying, quote, Come with me. I hid the contraband goods in the forest. And then will you share the money with me? Maria welcomed the conversation and found Alexander kind and understanding. She agreed to go with him to a park, and more specifically, to an area known for alcohol and contraband sales that were very lucrative. However, when the two arrived, something inside Alexander changed. He overpowered Maria and threw her down a 30-foot well. This was the same well that Alexander used to dispose of his victims. Amazingly, Maria managed to cling to the sides, all while being injured from the beating she had endured beforehand. Realizing what was happening, Maria played dead, causing Alexander to leave, believing that his job here was finished. After he had left, Maria began screaming for help, which caught the attention of others in the park who were able to rescue her. Maria reported the situation to the police. However, they refused to file a full report due to her being from a different area. She was forced to drop the report and Alexander was able to get away unpunished. He would continue on his spree until 2006 when he had claimed the lives of 49 people. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.